Hey, Sarah. You are setting up there? Yes. Okay, is that working well? Yeah, I can hear you from the room. Oh, you can hear me? Yeah, yeah, I can hear you. Yeah. I just want to share it with the Zoom. Oh, okay. Oh, so run down the stairs. Zach? Zach, you should be able to share your screen on the Zoom now. Okay, that looks good from our end. Uh, just so you know, during the Q&A section, I'm probably going to pop in. We usually have about 15 to 20 people on the Zoom, so there's some questions from our end. Is there a mic? Where's the mic? For my... It's on the podium. Usually you pick, fix everything up, but is, is there a point of it? Yeah. What have you got? Is there a red, red start? start. Oh, okay, cool, cool, cool. and it'll turn your slides backwards if you want. Huh? It's going mass me. It's you know, a lot of fun. Yeah. 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 So we're still trying to do 50% capacity a little bit here and get maps and stuff. And, and then there'll be a bunch of people online. And then we're recording your seminar so that okay. people who are in classes can. Yeah, great. The link will be ready later today. So um, people will watch your presentation. So, so you can trip whatever you see here, you can just trip it. Okay. <laughs> Good. I'll announce you, introduce you. Okay. And Dr. Lumley, um, if during the Q and A, if you could um, have the.
questions from the room, have them speak up so that the Zoom can hear. Um, that would be yeah. great. We'll try to get them to speak up, but also if you don't mind, if you can repeat yep. the questions, Zach. Yep. Yeah, try. And then we'll try to remember to come back to you, Saloa, <laughs> to see the if there's online questions, which we can't see. Yeah, no worries. All right, right on time, which never happens. So welcome to our warm and sunny spring seminar series. I drove into sleep just a while ago. Uh, we're happy to have um, Zach Sickman here as part of our faculty candidate interview. Uh, oh yeah, hang on a second. Oh, yeah, let's just, I'm just gonna, okay, make sure that. So let's so, so, so. All right, good. We just get the other displays on. Yeah, so Zach, Dr. Zach Sickman is visiting us as part of our faculty candidate interview uh, series. We're going to hire up to three candidates in sustainable or system science. And um, and so uh, we're recording this presentation. The link will be available online for anybody who wants to watch it. And uh, we're interested, search committee is interested in hearing feedback from anybody that wants to provide it. So Zach will be doing one-on-one -on -one interviews. He'll be doing group interviews with uh, one with the undergrads, one with the grad students, keeping pretty busy. So, uh, so and then uh, need your feedback by the end of the week. So uh, with that, uh, we'll welcome Zach. He's uh, he did his bachelor's uh, in uh, at Trinity. I believe. I gotta check that. Yeah, Trinity yeah, University right. uh, in Earth Sciences. He did his PhD at Stanford. Uh, and I believe Steve Graham was your PhD supervisor. Uh, several of us know Steve pretty well at Stanford Earth Sciences and then has been doing a postdoc at UT Austin. And loosely speaking, his background is space analysis, sedimentology, and so forth. And so we'd like to welcome you. You've got 45 minutes yep. to cover your research, a okay. bit of teaching, and then we'll do about 15 minutes Q&A. Okay. okay, well, that sounds good. Right. Well, um, first and foremost, thank you for coming and, and thank you for having me today. Uh, yeah, so I'm Zach Sickman, um, and what I'm going to be talking about today is some work that I've been doing over the last uh, two years or so, kind of applying uh, my basin analysis perspective on the world to uh, the sustainability issue of sand mining. Um, so we're going to kind of think about sand mining from source to sink, um, and how the largest sink for natural sediment is now in fact the built environment. So as, as one does in a talk like this, we'll start with kind of a, a big picture question of why study sediment or why am I a sedimentologist? Um, and so, you know, the fundamental answer is sediment is a record and sediment is a record of a number of different things. Uh, so what we're looking at here is about a kilometer of shallow marine stratigraphy down in Argentina of about Cretaceous age. So the fact that there's a kilometer of shallow marine stratigraphy here tells us something about the basin that it was rapidly subsiding during this time. It tells us something about the tectonics of the Southern Andes. The actual structures within the sedimentary strata tell us something about the currents that the basin was being subjected to. Maybe it can tell us the tidal range. It records the uh, history of Cretaceous life here in this petrified log. And then the individual grains of sediment themselves, their composition tells us something about perhaps how the fold and thrust belt was unroofing or the chemical composition of the arc uh, during the Cretaceous. So there's a lot of sediment, there's, there's a lot of information recorded in sediment and we've got decades and decades of kind of perspectives and methods and techniques to, to use that information that is stored in the sediment. Okay, so we'll go, we'll go to another fact here that in the modern world, sediment is a resource. And in fact, it is the largest solid material resource in terms of mass extracted globally. Uh, it is the second most extracted resource, second only to water. So most extracted solid material resource. Um, and sediment, natural sediment is used to, to build maybe even more things than you realize. Of course, there's silica in our smartphones, silica chips in our computers. 
um, concrete overpasses, reclaimed land. Uh, this is this is all kind of fundamental uh, importance in terms of how sediment builds our modern world. And so what we're going to talk about here is how I apply kind of my perspective from this background into understanding the sustainability of, of this modern reality that we live in. And so the use for sediment that I'm going to be primarily focused on is in concrete. So maybe maybe you know this or maybe you don't, um, but concrete. Oops. Concrete is about 70% uh, uh, natural sediment, sand and gravel. Aggregate material, oftentimes these days, uh, crushed rock is employed. Um, but what we can see from this, from this picture of my driveway at, at my house in Austin is we can see kind of a nice arcosic. You can see these nice case bar grains, lots of quartz, some chert fragments. Basically, it's sand from the Colorado River that's kind of held together with a little bit of cement and water. So the infrastructure, the concrete infrastructure, the most pervasive building material in the modern world is usually 70% natural sediment, natural coarse grain sediment. And so if we think about all of the driveways, all of the overpasses, all of the sidewalks in a city the size of Dallas, we can start to realize that what we're looking at is a very, very large volume of natural resource that needs to be extracted from natural systems. So we can think about this in terms of the scale of the issue that we're talking about here by comparing natural sediment resources uh, with uh, demand for uh, built environment construction. So if we look at a range of representative coarse sediment budgets for natural systems in the world, um, we start down here. The Santa Margarita River is a, a mountainous river in Southern California. Um, it produces about 30 to 40,000 cubic meters of sand and gravel naturally from its mountainous source regions and delivers it to the ocean every year. The Ganges River, a system that I'm gonna talk about here today, delivers about 40 million uh, cubic meters of mostly sand in the Ganges River. And uh, annual global bed load, annual global sand and gravel more or less, uh, delivery from all of the world's rivers to the oceans is on the order of about a billion cubic meters every year. Oops, wrong way. Okay, so if we think about the volume of material that is required to build basic infrastructure. And I'll point out here that everything on this slide is shown in a log scale, kind of compressing it so that we can look at different volumes of different orders of magnitude. Uh, the average school or hospital requires about 12 to 15,000 cubic meters of sand and gravel in the concrete and its foundation and pilings and so on. Uh, the Hoover Dam uh, used about 3 million cubic meters of aggregate material. Uh, Three Gorges Dam, about 19. Um, and then if we think about the uh, annual demand globally for sand and gravel to go into concrete construction alone, it's about 19 billion cubic meters of natural sedimentary material that is required to build concrete. And then if we think about the volume of sand and gravel that is sequestered in, in previously built infrastructure in countries like the US and China, we're talking about hundreds of billions of cubic meters of material. So, uh, you know, China or the U.S. alone on an annual basis is a larger sink for coarse sediment than is the global ocean. And so we show this at linear scale and you can really see what this means. Um, here is annual bed load flux of sand and gravel to the ocean. And here is annual demand for concrete alone. So there are 20 times more uh, sand and gravel goes into concrete than goes into the ocean every year. So. We can think about where we can extract this resource and what that means from a sedimentological perspective. So there, there's kind of three, you know, two or three different uh, end members here. So if we think about uh, the natural systems that produce sediment, there's some source region, that's some uplifted highland that is mechanically eroding. Uh, that material is being carried by some river system or maybe it's being blown by the wind. Uh, through some transfer zone where we have basically no net gain or loss of material. It's just an efficient transfer of that mass to some sink. And so if we think about the kind of mass balance of these natural systems, if we're taking sand out of a system that has a nice balance between sand in and sand out, that's clearly going to perturb the natural system, right? Now we can take sand and gravel out of, you know, perhaps an accommodation bound alluvial fan, or we can take it out of older deposits, perhaps in the subsurface of the seafloor, perhaps in an onshore sedimentary basin. But then we have ecological problems and we have the pervasive hole in the ground problem. You either put a hole in the ground or you perturb a natural system in terms of, of the massive sediment that it's transporting. 
So we can think from a very first principles process perspective about why this extraction perturbs a natural sedimentary system. So if we're sitting, if we're sitting in an area where there's no net gain or loss of sediment, we're basically transferring sediment to this part of the system. We can think of the balance there in terms of the sediment that's transported in, the sediment that's transported out over some period of time, and then the sediment that's stored in the system. And so let's say a natural river like the Trinity River, the Brazos River, the Red River, uh, generates a, a fluvial morphology that is a function of the amount of sediment that's being carried in and the amount of sediment that's being transported out. You get nice meander bins, maybe you're in a braided system. The system de uh, develops kind of a natural quasi-equilibrium state that is a function of this mass balance. Now, if we start anthropogenically extracting sediment from this system that has its own carrying capacity, it has its own mass that it quote unquote wants to be transferring through the system. If we take anthropogenically take sediment out of the system, the water, the, the fluid that's flowing through the system still has a carrying capacity. So it's going to re-equilibrate the carrying capacity by remobilizing material that should otherwise naturally remain stored. And if we progress through this system long enough and we extract enough, eventually we basically strip the, we strip the river down to bedrock. We, we remove more uh, sand out of the system than the system would naturally be storing. Otherwise, the system continues to naturally transfer sand uh, further down system. And we end up with a, a river that's stripped to bedrock. And this is a common current occurrence um, in lots of places currently in the world and has previously been a common situation present um, in the US, although we don't really do this very much in the US anymore. So we know that uh, sand and gravel extraction from active sedimentary systems is a sustainability issue. It, it is fundamentally unsustainable. The problem arises when we get to this question right here, which of these is cheaper? So this is sand mining from the Ganges River, a system that I'm gonna talk about in just a second. Um, and this is a sand mine down south of San Antonio that's mining out of the Carrizo sand in the Wilcox group. And so if we think about what it requires to get sand from here to a concrete plant, you send some people out in a dump truck, you fill it up with a shovel, and then you drive off to the concrete plant. It's already pretty washed. It's already nicely sorted. It's basically the material that you want. You just put it in the back of a truck and you take it wherever you want it to go. Whereas here, you dig a big hole in the ground, you put the raw material on a conveyor belt, you wash it in a size sorter, then you have to put it on a truck, drive it to the, you know, so and so basically the cost of extracting directly from natural sedimentary systems is much, much cheaper than the cost of digging a hole in the ground and processing topsoil out of it, you know, all, all the different things that you have to do um, when you're mining out of previously stored deposits. So from an economic perspective, we know that it's unsustainable, but there's a, there's a profound economic incentive, particularly in areas that are rapidly developing to go with the cheapest source possible. And so anytime you have something that you know is bad, but there's an incentive to do it, you basically develop an illicit supply network for it. Or, or you know, in, in a lot of places in the developing world, you actually develop um, true, true criminal networks uh, to supply sand from areas that are, that are known to be places that should not be extracted from. But the economic incentive of the local economy basically dictates that it, that it is still advantageous to do so illegally. So there's kind of three fundamental areas of big picture uh, questions in terms of uh, sand mining sustainability. The first is how much sand is extracted. Um, some countries like the US and Canada, Germany, uh, keep decent uh, reporting numbers on how much sand and gravel is mined every year, you know, through the USGS or, or various uh, equivalents in Europe. Um, but by and large, for the vast majority of the world, we have no idea how much sand is actually extracted from direct observation. As I'll talk about um, in a little bit, we have some proxies for how much sand we know must be extracted based on trends in economic growth and trends in other material use. But in terms of direct evidence, we basically have virtually no idea how much sand is extracted across most of this planet. Then of course, uh, a fundamental uh, kind of flip side of that is how much sand is produced. So bed load uh, sediment fluxes, coarse grain sediment fluxes are notoriously difficult to calculate quantitatively. Um, you know, for suspended sediment load, we can put sediment traps in a river. Um, there are acoustic methods that can tell you what the suspended concentration of sediment is in a river. Um, but in terms of the stuff that's being transported in, in traction uh, transport on the bed load at the bottom of a stream, 
uh, it, it's kind of an open question in a lot of places. And the best that we have are kind of rating curves that, that tell us how much order of magnitude should be produced. But um, getting better actual uh, coarse grain sediment flux estimates is a fundamental question um, in the sustainability of sand mining. Um, and then where does the sand go? So as you'll see uh, in the Ganges case study, um, it's, it's relatively easy to see where the sand is being mined, but then it goes into a truck and who knows uh, where it goes. Um, and like I said, you know, in countries like the US and Canada, as I'll show a case study here in Texas, you just call up the concrete plant and you say, hey, where'd you get your sand? And they tell you. But in countries where there is an illegal network developed or countries where there's just no record keeping, it's really difficult to know exactly where the sand is going once it leaves um, its natural source. So I'm gonna address kind of uh, the top and the bottom questions here with some case studies that I'm working on. So we'll start with sand mining uh, on the Ganges River in Bangladesh. Um, and so uh, I'll start by acknowledging my collaborators on this project. Um, Dr. Aurora Torres is a postdoc at uh, UC Levant in Belgium. Uh, she's a postdoctoral scholar who's an ecologist um, and has done a lot of the really seminal kind of reviews on, on quantifying the impact, the ecological impact of the global sand crisis, quote unquote. Uh, and Amal Sadiq is a country director for Oxfam in Bangladesh. It's a nonprofit organization uh, focused on resource equity and kind of environmental uh, justice. Um, and then Nick Lammers, uh, who is a PhD student at UC Berkeley, and he's kind of the data scientist um, on the project. So he's, he's the one that coded up a lot of what um, we're going to see here. And so we'll start with what we see on this image. Um, it is kind of a fundamentally important theme of, of these sand barges uh, pumping sand to shore, basically extracting sand from the middle of the active Ganges River system and pumping it onto shore for further use in the commodity sand market in Bangladesh. So like I said, understanding how much sand is extracted from a given locality is a fundamentally important question, but it's a fundamentally difficult question. And it's a fundamentally difficult question, particularly when you're thinking about in-stream extractions in a river, because oftentimes the volume that's being extracted is being dredged up from a riverbed. And so in a, in a turbid river like the Ganges, the Mekong, uh, the kind of pockmarked dredging scars that are left behind are hidden beneath water that you can't see through. Um, and they're often erased every year. Um, if you have the money, like Chris Hackney did for this study in 2020 on the Mekong, you can go in and you can shoot a multi-beam survey, but that's not a feasible method for monitoring long-term across an entire system. Um, or you can go in and you can actually do uh, 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 survey. You can actually go in and ask uh, people that are working in the supply chain how much sand is being extracted and where it's going and these kinds of things. Obviously, this is very labor intensive. And if the activity is illegal, there's incentive to be opaque uh, in the answer. Um, so really finding ways to remotely monitor sand extraction, quantify sand extraction uh, long term are really important here. So we, we're kind of lucky in the Ganges in Bangladesh. Um, because of this uh, thing that they do in the supply chain. They stockpile the sand um, in the onshore. So instead of going out to a dredge barge, filling up these boats, coming to shore, and pumping the sand directly into a rail car or directly into the back of a truck, uh, on the Ganges River, they stockpile it in these big piles of sand onshore. And they do this for a couple of reasons. <laughs> Um, and not the least of which is that the flow of the Ganges River is dictated by the monsoon cycle. So it's very hard to mine during the high flow season. It's much easier to mine during the low flow season. You mine a bunch of sand during the low flow season, you stockpile it on the shore, and then you can use that sand throughout the rest of the year. So basically what we do on the Ganges is we monitor this snapshot in time, this intermediate storage step of sand being extracted um, to get kind of well, it is the first quantification of, Gan uh, of Ganges sand mining. Um, and it's one of the few examples in the world where we can actually put decent confidence on a, on a true number, uh, a, a true volume that's being extracted from this system. So I'll just note the study area here. Uh, this, is, this is the border between India and Bangladesh, uh, this black line here. Uh, this is the lower Ganges River. So everything that we're looking at is on the Bangladesh side of the border. 
Uh, they don't actually use the stockpiling method uh, in India for some reason. I don't know why yet. Um, but so we're sitting, we're sitting here in kind of the lower part of the, the broader Himalayan Proforlin uh, and the kind of upper part of the Ganges Brahmaputra Delta uh, in the lower Ganges before it meets the Brahmaputra River. So there are a couple of important things to note here. And the first is the scale of the system that we're looking at. So this channel belt is somewhere between two to nearly 20 kilometers wide, the active channel belt, the, the width of a channel belt that's actively avulsing and transporting sand sized sediment on a, on a annual to decadal basis. This is either the second largest or tied for the first largest sand dispersal system in the world. And then obviously number one being right next door in the Brahmaputra. So the country of Bangladesh is a rapidly developing country and it is full of sand resources in terms of active sediment dispersal systems, having the combined largest sand dispersal system in the world. So what we did is we went along this stretch of the river and we mapped all the instances of areas of sand stockpiles. Uh, and then we also mapped all the instances of uh, bar mines, basically um, those dendritically expanding mines that I've shown a snapshot of where they actually go and scrape sand off of the severely exposed bar as opposed to in stream. Um, I'm not gonna talk about those. They extract a couple million uh, cubic meters of sand, which is non-trivial, but it's trivial compared to the volumes that I'm gonna talk about in terms of what's stockpiled. Um, and then just for reference, uh, this right here is Harding Bridge. Um, it is the only bridge that connects the southwestern part of Bangladesh uh, to the rest of the country across the Ganges. And it is where all of the hydrograph information, when I talk about natural sand load uh, down the Ganges later, um, it all comes from instrumentation that's sitting kind of right here in the lower third of our study area. Okay, so how do we, how do we actually monitor this? Um, well, fundamentally, it, it, you know, sand can only pile up in one way, basically. You pile it up and it, it sits at the angle of repose. Um, so, you know, based on the basic physics of how sand is piled, uh, we, we can basically map these features, look at how they're filling and depleting through time and get a very basic volume uh, model of these things based on basic measurements that we can take from satellite imagery using basically trig to uh, estimate the max plateau height. Um, and then we map the basal area. Uh, the stockpiles are formed by this process of pumping a sand slurry into the onshore and, and, and piling up into this, this kind of truncated uh, trapezoid thing um, that, that is basically universally employed in stockpiles. So we can, uh, so the model, the model that I'm gonna show is kind of a, a very simplified version of what we're doing. Um, we've got a little bit more complexity in the model that we're using now in terms of the variability and the shapes and the sizes. But what I'm gonna show now is basically, um, you know, you come up with some, some representative curve of basal area uh, to stockpile plateau height. And as you can imagine, you can't, you can't pile a plateau infinitely tall. It's just not possible and it's also not practical. Um, so the, the kind of max plateau height that they achieve does kind of go uh, asymptotic at some point where you know, the very large ones are not all that much taller than the medium sized ones. And so we can develop this relationship uh, that we can use to basically uh, model the individual volumes of each stockpile on the river. And so what we do is we go in and we map the perimeter of each stockpile. Uh, then we import it into ARC. We convert the vertices into points. We project them into a, a coordinate system that we can input into our MATLAB model. Um, and then we generate a volume, a volume model for each individual stockpile uh, through time. And so we can model the total storage capacity of each individual stockpile. And then we can model how uh, they fill and deplete through time, following very simple rules of how sand sits the angle repose and our max, our max stockpile height uh, rating curve. Okay, so here's a, here's a little GIF of one stockpiling area and how it changes through time. And I'll note that our, our current database has, you know, approaching 28,000 uh, individual stockpiles along the entire stretch of the river between about uh, 2002 and 2021. And you can see that the, the position, the size, and the shape of them changes pretty drastically through time. Um, basically, what you're seeing is you're seeing shifts in the riverbank, uh, natural shifts in the riverbank, and natural shifts in the position of the stockpiling areas. Every low flow season, the river is a little bit different. Um, but there's a general trend for them growing through time. So we map all the stockpile footprints. We uh, generate um, the data set of the growth of each individual stockpiling area. 
and then we can we can basically generate a, a growth curve um, for an individual stockpiling area. So you can see our data points are here in blue. Then we can interpolate some smooth uh, growth trend uh, through them. And so basically, what you're seeing is you're seeing monsoon cycles where they grow during the low flow season, they deplete during the monsoon season, they grow during the low flow season with this overall trend towards increasing in their stockpile capacity as a function of demand for sand in Bangladesh. So we do that for all of our stockpiling regions. We generate a bunch of growth curves and then we compile them into a total stockpile capacity through time where we go from virtually nothing uh, about 15 years ago um, to almost 8 million cubic meters of total stockpile capacity through time. But we know that they don't just fill and deplete once every season, they're constantly filling and depleting. So we need to apply a flux out rate uh, to that total stockpile capacity. So um, we're working on getting more spatially and temporally uh, heterogeneous uh, estimates on this. Um, but our best guess right now is that about 3.5% of total stockpile capacity is exported out every day. So we apply the total stockpile capacity, we, we apply that flux out rate to the total stockpile capacity to get an estimate for the total volume of sand that is being extracted and transferred through these stockpiles uh, every year. And so we can see a rapid increase over the last 15 years, uh, such that, you know, on the upper end of our estimate, which, which I think is pretty realistic um, at this point, uh, a volume equivalent to the natural sand flux of the Ganges River is being extracted and transferred through these stockpiles every year. So clearly, if we're talking about the mass balance, the sand in, the sand out, the sand remobilized in the Ganges River. Clearly, this is a sustainability issue. So we can actually put some numbers to it if we basically plug uh, the, the extraction volumes and the natural sand flux volumes into this basic mass balance equation. And we can see that there's a deficit of somewhere around 16 to 36 uh, million cubic meters of sand um, being extracted from the Ganges every year. And so that means that the river, based on the carrying capacity of the river, is remobilizing uh, that sediment. So basically it's equivalent to removing one large sandbar uh, from the river every year. And so if we look at what's actually driving this uh, extraction in terms of economic trends, we can look at some proxies uh, for the use of sand and concrete and economic growth, um, where this blue curve is what we estimate the sand and gravel needed to make concrete from all of the cement that is produced in the country. So remember, there's a, there's a very set ratio of one to seven in terms of cement to sand. So if we know how much cement is being produced in the country, we know how much sand needs to go into that concrete. And we can see this kind of exponential increase in that. Interestingly, this dashed line right here shows the reported and projected actual uh, domestic non-metal mineral extraction, which is basically sand and gravel. So we can see that the domestic reported numbers and the projected numbers don't capture this abrupt uh, increase in demand for sand, whereas our satellite observations do. Um, and then if we just look at the GDP of Bangladesh through time, uh, we can just see that this country is growing very rapidly. And a rapidly growing country, as you can see in the expansion of the impervious uh, surface cover in the capital city, Dhaka, from uh, 1980 to 2015, uh, has been very rapid. Obviously, there's a lot of demand for sand in the system, and it seems like the economic demand for the growth of urban infrastructure in the country is really driving what is fundamentally unstable, uh, unsustainable sand extraction from the Ganges River. Okay, so in terms of long-term goals for this project, um, we're working on a monitoring scheme where we can monitor uh, sand mining in the country long-term. Uh, so sand comes from the Ganges, the Brahmaputra, the Silet region coming off of the Shillong uh, Fault and Trust Belt up here, and uh, down here off of the Indo Burman ranges. There are various other groups that are working on the other three components of this. We will continue to work on the Ganges in terms of long term uh, monitoring of sand extraction going forward. Um, we're working on correlating uh, sand mining extraction to local demand trends, basically, does the sand extraction in the Ganges reflect local growth or does it reflect? more broad domestic growth, perhaps in DACA? Um, and then can we reconstruct past uh, sand supply networks? And so that is kind of a segue into uh, the next case study that I'm gonna be talking about, where it's great when we can see what's going on. It's great where we can see the sand mining in satellite imagery, 
but it's one thing to carry the observation past the point of extraction. And so one of the things that I know as a sedimentologist that, that kind of grew up working on ancient basins um, is the way that you do that is you, you do provenance analysis. You look at the composition of the sediment, you look at the composition of the sand to, to say where it's coming from. And so there's basically no reason why you couldn't do that in a commodity sand supply chain the same way that you can do it in a natural sediment dispersal system. So basically, with these collaborators and new ones here being uh, Reza Ferron, who is a professor of civil architectural and environmental engineering at UT Austin, and then Kiana Fithian, who's an undergraduate student in computer sciences at UT. Um, we're basically generating a case study that, that demonstrates the efficacy of using sand provenance analysis to track commodity sand supply chains. And so we did it in Texas. Um, and the basic trajectory, the basic sand supply network in Texas is sand is extracted from one of these sand mines that's outlined in red. Uh, it is taken to either uh, some kind of larger plant that generates uh, bags of concrete, quick crete, like what you buy at Home Depot to build a fence in your backyard. Um, or in terms of volume, more often it's taken to a, a concrete batch plant. Um, so Martin Marietta, Tex-Mex, these big, if you're, if you're pouring a driveway, you call one of these companies and they come out with a cement truck or they come out with a concrete truck uh, and, they, and they pour your concrete for you. So basically by calling the companies, calling the sand mines, um, looking at satellite imagery, looking at previously published compilations, we can reconstruct the total sand supply chain in the state of Texas. Um, and we can use that to go out and sample different points of, this, of the supply chain and see if we can use the provenance signature, the composition of the sediment, to basically generate the known supply network based on sand composition alone. So we went out and did that. I drove around to a bunch of sand mines and batch plants um, and Home Depots and bought a bunch of samples um, all the way from Amarillo uh, down through Austin to San Antonio, uh, sampling the original source, the sand mine itself, sampling the concrete batch plant, the place that the sand mine ships the sand to, and then basically buying uh, bags of concrete from Home Depot. Um, so basically what we're looking at here is the sand mine to batch plant is kind of the local to regional distribution network. Um, and then these, these factories that produce bags of concrete distribute their sand, uh, distribute their product much more widely. So that kind of shows the kind of broad reach uh, of, of defining a much larger sand supply network. So the question of will the composition of sand uh, be uh, usable to tie back to the original source, it, it, from a first order perspective, it's kind of a silly one. Yes, it will. Uh, the answer is obvious, uh, depending on the technique and depending on the time and money that you're willing to invest into answering that question. Uh, the real trick comes into doing it in a cost-effective way and in consideration of the fact that this sand does go through a little bit of sorting. It goes through some hydrodynamic sorting. It goes through some size sorting. So we're not looking at just true raw natural sand. We are looking at sand that goes through a little bit of processing. And so. The question is, does this processing change the compositional signature in any appreciable way that's going to destroy the information, or at least destroy the information that's cheaply accessible in the sand? So if we think about you know, various methods for provenance analysis, we've got cost of analysis down here, training required to, to do the analysis, and you, know, you can plot different, uh, different methods. And what we're looking for is basically something, something down here, something that's cheap and easy, and broadly exportable because if we're going to export this into other places in the developing world where this is actually an issue it's not feasible to go out and do analyses that cost thousands of dollars and require a phd geoscientist um, so what i'm going to show initially um, is the, the thin section petrography results from our initial sample set and we can see that it, it actually works really well um, and and the the sand distribution network uh, across the state of Texas is actually pretty easily distinguishable based on uh, sand petrography alone, um, where we have the stuff coming out of South Texas is coming out of very, very silica rich uh, paleogene uh, sandstone deposits, and the rest of it is coming out of Pleistocene terraces of, you know, Pleistocene to Holocene river systems. Um, and so we can distinguish stuff that's coming out of the Colorado drainage from the Wilcox stuff. We can distinguish stuff coming out of the Panhandle from stuff coming from North Central Texas in the Abilene region. Um, and then uh, to plot samples on here that we knew for sure would be very different 
uh, we also sampled uh, some stuff in the Bay Area of California, uh, which, is, which is very easily distinguishable. So that's great. The petrography works, um, but you know, even the petrography um, is not too expensive, but it does require a fair bit of skill. So in terms of a broadly exportable tool that somebody in Bangladesh is gonna use, yes, there are people in Bangladesh that can do this, but we wanna make it as broadly exportable as possible. So we wanna find something that is truly down here at the origin. Uh, and that's uh, something that we come up with in terms of image analysis. So as I was processing these samples, I realized that I, I could tell the difference between sand from different mines pretty easily with my eyes. And, you know, granted, I've got a fair bit of training in this, um, so maybe that's not that surprising, but, but the differences are actually pretty obvious. And so we'll plot um, Bay Area sand from Temple. This is actually coming out of sand mines up here in Dallas. Um, a sample from Austin, San Antonio, Amarillo, and Abilene. And so we can see pretty clearly that there are some distinct differences in the color uh, and the range of colors in these sands. And this is because they're, they're clean, they're washed. It's reflective of kind of the natural stable mineralogy as opposed to going up to a sandstone outcrop that's maybe weathered and, and turned to you know, garbage and not reflective of the color of the original mineralogy. These are nice clean sands. So we can do something with image analysis. So we take a couple hundred images of our sample set uh, and we feed it into a machine learning algorithm. We, we use transfer learning to train a neural network to identify uh, the source of sand based on characteristics that I, it IDs uh, in the image itself, and it works surprisingly well. So here on uh, the left is where the sample actually comes from, where we tell the model that it comes from in, in the training set that we, we give the uh, machine learning algorithm, the training set, we say, here's where the sand came from, see what you can see in terms of differences and similarities to other places. And then here is what the algorithm outputs in terms of where it thinks it came from. So if it worked perfectly, everything on this diagonal would be a one, it would be 100% effective. And you see, by and large, it is, it is pretty darn good. And you know, obviously, uh, it's easy with the California sand. The California sand is clearly very different than everything else. But what I, think is, what I think is pretty surprising is that it can distinguish the Llano River from the Colorado River. The Llano River is the largest sand producing tributary of the Colorado River. So that's a little bit surprising to me that that was that effective. And then we also see another interesting trend in that it struggles to distinguish uh, material from the Colorado River uh, from stuff that's actually mined up here in Dallas. And that the fact that it struggles to do that is reflective of the way that these machine learning algorithms work, because we only have two samples from Dallas. And it is a function of how good your training set is, right? So I fixed that on the drive up here yesterday. And I took a bunch of sand samples uh, from concrete sand. Um, so next time I give this talk, uh, this, this will be fixed. Um, okay, so then the question going forward is, can we build some useful sand ID database um, that can be used in, in kind of a global sense to, to uh, monitor uh, sand supply networks and areas of concern, uh, you know, outlined here in red, uh, and particularly areas with very complex sand distribution networks. So this is, this is kind of the export import uh, trajectory of sand in South and Southeast Asia. Very complex, you think about like Singapore, Hong Kong, Taiwan, uh, these places don't have a heck of a lot of natural sand resources themselves, but they have a lot of growth. Um, so they have to import quite a lot of sand from other places. And uh, conveniently, the geology of South and Southeast Asia is very complex. So it's very likely that we'll have leverage in using the uh, composition of the sand um, to actually say something interesting about the, the supply networks there. Um, so I'll just, I'll just briefly touch on a couple other ongoing projects that I have. Uh, this one turns out to be another sand mining project, um, but uh, I'm on a collaborative project with some people at the USGS uh, and uh, another uh, researcher at UT Austin, um, hired by the state of California to address the sustainability of sand mining in San Francisco Bay. Um, and so, you know, what, what you're seeing here is basically a grain size map of the bay and there's actually several million uh, cubic meters of sand extracted from uh, this area just south of Angel Island. And so basically we're going in to study the sand dispersal system from source to sink um, and, and address this question of is the volume that they're extracting uh, leading to outer coast erosion or, or other uh, unsustainable things um, for the future. I've also got a couple of uh, natural system projects 
Uh, I've been working on the tectonic evolution of the Southern Gulf of Mexico for a couple of years now um, in a joint industry project at UC, the GBDS group, um, where we basically have access to a lot of subsurface uh, data. And I specifically have been working on the neogene, uh, the kind of Miocene to modern uh, tectonic evolution and collapse of the Western margin of the basin as a function of kind of the broader tectonic regime of, of Western North America. Um, and then I've got this project that I've been uh, playing with for a number of years now of trying to uh, define the sand supply framework to the Texas coast uh, since the last glacial maximum. Basically thinking about uh, how the proportion of sand coming from various rivers and transgressive erosion supplies sand to the barrier island of the Texas coast at the time and how that might be changing in response to kind of anthropogenically accelerated sea level rise. Okay, so I'll, I'll just spend the last five minutes here talking about um, teaching a little bit. So most of my teaching experience to date, at least in terms of the classes for which I was the instructor of record, uh, have been field classes. So I taught the field methods class uh, at UT Austin uh, before the pandemic. Um, so basically teaching uh, sophomores and juniors the skills that they need to go to field camp the next summer, uh, teaching the, the said strat and uh, field mapping component of that. Uh, this summer, I'll be teaching the marine geology and geophysics field course, or co-teaching it with uh, two geophysics professors at UT. Um, I'll be doing the onshore, uh, the onshore kind of coastal geomorphology of barrier islands component to that, uh, where the, the other half is kind of offshore seismic surveys. Um, and then in terms of thinking about ideas for future curriculum, and, and particularly ideas for future curriculum and along this theme of sustainability, I think that there's a lot that can be done um, by framing these sustainability questions, kind of how I've done it here in terms of the broader earth system and understanding, from my perspective, the sedimentary system uh, and, and how that plays out in, in kind of resource sustainability questions, social equity questions, global development questions, and, and understanding the fact that we need to know something about the sediment source regions to know something about the sediment resource further down system. We need to know something about the local economy to know how much sand is being incentivized uh, in, in terms of the extraction volumes. And then understanding the broader natural earth system dynamics uh, that that configuration is perturbing. So, you know, there's obvious, uh, obvious to me, I guess, uh, case studies or classes that could be built around any one of, of these sand mining projects that I'm currently working on. Um, whether it's in Bangladesh, uh, thinking about the broader Himalayan to the Ganges Brahmaputra dispersal system, and thinking about um, you know, questions of economy and equity in a developing country, uh, as compared to, you know, obviously, one could run a pretty easy uh, uh, class here in Texas, being in Texas, you could actually go out and look at what the local sand supply network looks like. Interestingly, just walking around Dallas, the sidewalks are different from the sidewalks in Austin which I think is cool. Um, and then, uh, you know, the San Francisco. Yeah, the sand. Yeah, no, I'm just joking. Uh, yeah. Well, it's, it's funny. I, I, see it, I, I see it in Netflix shows that I look at now. They're like the, drive, the driveway of a show is like clearly made from sand from a different mine than, you know. Anyway, um, yeah, so, so uh, you know, one could, one could envision, uh, you know, any, any number of things done with a specific case study in one of these systems. And I'll just briefly talk about uh, one such course that I will be running this summer. Um, I'll be running it for our GeoForce program, which is, which is a high school outreach program um, uh, that UT Austin runs at the Jackson School. Um, but I'll, I'll basically be doing this uh, in Central Texas, where we'll be running through the Colorado system. Uh, we'll be running through um, basically, this is the Llano River. Um, so, you know, we'll be talking about why the Llano uplift produces a lot of sand because it's granitic. Um, we'll talk about how that uh, sand in the Llano River hits this backstop of the dammed Colorado River system. We'll go out to Mansfield Dam where I'll actually have students uh, build little models, build little concrete models with sand that we grab from the Llano River. We put a little cement in there and we say, Oh, look, the, the dam that is damming the system is built with sand from the system that it is damming. 
Um, and then we go downstream. This is the last, the last dam in the system, Longhorn Dam here, uh, just uh, on the south side of Austin. Um, and we look at how the system is re-equilibrating uh, its sand load by eroding old Pleistocene terraces. And so we can see that the river coming out of Longhorn Dam is just barren bedrock in the stream. And then it's eroding sand out of uh, this little tributary by these softball fields. Um, and this is all uh, Pleistocene Colorado River terraces. The, the river has to cannibalize uh, to re-equilibrate, you know, forming sandbars downstream. Okay, and that's my time. Great, thanks. Yeah. ask a hydrology question. Yeah. Um, so is there any uh, research to be done in terms of uh, changes in recharge, especially in regional aquifers yeah. with sand mining? Yeah. Basin? Yep, yep, yep. Yeah, that's, that's, that's a whole field of study. Um, also thinking about salinity, salinity intrusion in coastal areas. And yeah, that's, that's a whole thing. But I haven't worked on it, but there are people that do. Okay, and an optimization problem really. Mm -hmm. How about uh, sand for fracking in Texas? Is it? Yep. Yeah. Um, the volume of sand that, that is used for fracking is not nearly of the same order of magnitude as what goes into concrete. It's like, you know, we're, we are currently standing on thousands of cubic meters of sand, um, but it, it is a factor. It, it needs a, like a cleaner silica sand, though. So, like, there's specific sources of sand that's suitable for fracking. And they basically put it on a train and they run it out to West Texas or wherever. Um, but the sand that's used in concrete, you know, other than other than certain grain size and uh, size distribution requirements, you can basically throw anything into concrete, and so you can get it anywhere. Bob, questions? Yeah, Bob in the back. Oh, so the, the to me the sand richest river in this region is the Red River. So yep. Don't mention it. Yeah, well, I, I haven't sampled any supply chains that far north. Um, the stuff that uh, I, the northernmost supply chain that I've sampled, I think is coming out of the Trinity, uh, terraces in the Trinity. But there are, there are uh, sand mines on the Red River and they're included in that map that I showed, the, the mines on the Red River are on there. Um, but just the supply chains that I've looked at don't use it to my knowledge. You don't make it to Amarillo? Well, the, the very, the very like headwaters of the Red River system, and some of the kind of alluvial plain stuff that's coming out of the Southern Rockies, um, is what's in the Amarillo. So yeah, in terms of the, the proper Red River trunk stream just north of us, I haven't looked at that. But the Southern Amarillo probably is coming out of headwater Red River stuff. So we actually have a Zoom question. Uh, yeah, there's someone in the chat. Um, we have oh, Catherine. Nice who's a PhD student. Catherine, if you wanna unmute and ask your question. All right, thank you. Um, first off, is my sound okay? <laughs> yes, uh, your sound is fixed. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thanks. Um, so you were talking about how mining lowers the riverbed um, and changes the banks, but then the river has the same carrying capacity. So that would actually imply that there was no change in water volume. So I wanted to know if there was actually a relationship between the sand mining in the river and then the water volume availability, since it actually is changing the morphology. And then if so, how would you quantify that relationship? Right, so, um, I mean, at least in a, in a system the size of the Ganges, the, the individual pockmarks that are being dredged are, are very small as compared to the total discharge of the river. So I, I think that the carrying capacity of particularly a large system is really dictated by, you know, in the, in the case of the Ganges, the monsoon cycle, the, the precipitation and, and the very large discharge coming out of such a large system is, is of a larger uh, scale than what the individual mining extractions are doing in terms of perturbing the channel geometry. That having been said, there are examples in smaller systems where the, the dredging does affect the overall channel geometry and deepens and widens the channel and does slow down the flow uh, of the river, thereby decreasing the local carrying capacity. Um, so in smaller systems, that is an issue. Um, in the big system, the Ganges that I've studied, I, I, I would imagine that that's not an issue. Uh, as to how to address that, um, there, there are people that have modeled, uh, basically numerically modeled what happens when you dig um, a big hole in the bottom of a river 
um, and basically you you headwardly erode the kind of upstream end of that of that dredged pit, and then you slow the flow down um, in the area uh, of the pit. So basically, you headwardly erode the pit, and then that material is then deposited um, in the in the scour that that pit left. So a, a much more local issue um, than the the big system scale um, extraction. Are there other online questions, Solo? Yes, we have several, but if we want to go back and forth between the Zoom and the meeting. All right. Any other questions in the room here? Yeah, Katie. Um, so you said you teach uh, some field courses. Mm -hmm. uh, is that your preferred mode of teaching, or do you require a more complex stuff? Oh, I mean, I if the class allows, I would prefer to do it in the field. Um, but you know, it's that's not always possible. Um, some classes, but yeah, I mean, if we can, if we can stand on the bank of the Trinity River and talk about this stuff, I would, I would personally rather do that than teach in the classroom. Well, maybe back to Solola if we're gonna ping pong. So we have Anne Molding. So Anne, if you want to unmute and ask your question. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Oh, great. Okay. So when I'm looking at your site at the Ganges River. Um, I'm not seeing any sorting facilities. And I think what you mentioned was that uh, sand coming out of these rivers is usually, um, you know, you basically can truck it off to wherever you're gonna use it. Yep. And, um, you know, it, it's cheaper to do it that way. Right. Um, but is it, is it uh, does that, you, I know you need a well-graded sand to create a good concrete. Um, are these sands graded well enough to make good concrete or is there poorly developed concrete from this and are we facing a construction disaster yeah. down the road? Yeah, okay. So that's a, that's a really interesting question. Um, and I, I recently went down a rabbit hole of Bangladeshi engineering literature on concrete, basically Bangladeshi concrete engineers publishing optimal mixtures for concrete uh, construction uh, domestically. And so basically what they have to do is they have to take the sand from the Ganges and they have to mix it with gravel that's coming out of one of the fold and thrust belts in the periphery of the country. Um, so like the Shillong fold and thrust belt out to the north or coming off the Indo-Burman ranges uh, down to the southeast um, because the sand in the Ganges is pretty well sorted fine to medium sand. So it makes a good volumetric matrix um, but they have to add gravel from one of the fold and thrust belts to, to make it a, a structurally strong um, building material. Another thing that they do do actually also with this sand is they don't actually mix it with cement to make concrete. They just hard pack it in a foundation. So they dump a lot of it over a very wide area and then they, they tamp it down, tamp it down um, to make a, kind of a simple broad foundation that they then build on. Thanks. So you research started with some aspects of civil engineering, like you work for building social infrastructure, and then we move about the hydrogeology process, and then we finally talk about geology. So if you divide these three sections, what was the most convincing and interesting part of your research? Oh, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a geologist. I, I learned the other stuff uh, for this project. Um, and so, like I said, on the fingerprinting project, we're working with uh, Dr. Risa Ferron, who is a concrete material scientist. Um, and so um, I know that stuff insofar as it informs the, the earth science work. Um, and I would be very happy to find collaborators in those fields that could bring a, a comparable level of expertise um, to the issue in kind of a more multidisciplinary way. Um, but this, you know, studying sand mining as a, as a sustainability issue is kind of a, a growing field. The issue has been recognized as globally important for uh, probably 10 years now, eight, 10 years now. Um, but it's only within the last two or three years that real, like, true uh, research projects have been devoted to it in a multidisciplinary way. Back to you, Saloa. All right, next up is Zial, if you want to unmute and ask your question. Hi, Dr. Sigman, can you hear me? Yes. Yep. 
Yeah, thanks. Very nice presentation. Actually, I am from Bangladesh, and I am very glad to see you have done all your work there. Good. So, uh, my question is: Do you have any estimation what percentage of sand is being extracted compared to the what the river is actually carrying? Because we know that Ganges is one of the largest sand system in the world. Yeah, it, it's it's a hundred percent of the natural load. Um, so. You know the, the the part of the river that we're studying is still a relatively efficient transfer zone, right? So the mass of sand is still moving through. Um, it is depositing in the overbank. It is depositing in the broader braided channel system, uh, certainly over the de the decadal time scale. Um, but it still is a transfer zone, um, and so our our estimates suggest that a hundred percent or a volume equivalent to a hundred percent of the natural sand load is already being extracted, and back of the envelope calculations suggest that anything over 10% is probably enough to induce a deficit that is gonna be re-equilibrated with erosion. Um, so it's, it's well, well, well into unsustainable uh, territory. So you think if we can stop that, we can stop the riverbank erosion in the downstream, which, is, which costs millions of dollars every year? Yeah, it, it, will, it will definitely make it better. Um, there's also there's also questions about what the Faraka barrage is doing um, in terms of impounding sediment upstream as well. Um, but yeah, I mean, extracting 100% of the natural sand load to go put it in concrete uh, is not helping downstream erosion. Mm, right. Thank you. Thank you. Back to the room here. Just questioning. Hey, thank you so much for the talk. So I have several questions. I really want to know what you want. Uh, the first thing is about sustainable geology or the future of the sustainable development issue. Uh, what do you think, like, more geology, geology of this is, uh, can fit in this kind of work? Because this whole system thing, like you mentioned, there are a lot of different disciplinary knowledge that evolve. And how much do you think as to geologists students at this know more than just the geology part and yeah. know more about other I would say if we cooperate with other teams should we just focus on what we already learned is there any kind of other disciplinary knowledge we should learn about yeah so I mean I, I can I can speak to a couple of like big picture things that I that I think are important. Um, I I think you know, you can, you can kind of break down earth science sustainability into a couple of bucket uh, issues, you know, climate change, uh, solid resource sustainability, water, uh, pollutants. Um, and so I think it's important to understand the actual human factor that is driving each one of them, right? So like for me, it's important to understand the economy in Bangladesh, or it's important for me to understand the economy in Texas uh, in terms of what's driving what, what, what's the fundamental driver behind the sustainability question that I'm applying my expertise to, right? So I, I think that it's important to understand uh, a more multidisciplinary system scale perspective of not just how you're applying your geology or science knowledge, but understanding the human system that's driving the issue as well, right? And then, you know, depending on what your specific expertise is, um, there's all kinds of subdisciplines um, within sustainability science that, that you can apply it to, you know, like, I'm I'm a I'm a basin analyst and a subsurface stratigrapher. You know, I can work on carbon uh, sequestration. Uh, you know, someone that does groundwater obviously can do pollutants and these kinds of things. Uh, but to, to answer the bigger picture question, understanding something about the human system that's driving the, the issue, I think is important beyond your just basic geology uh, background. Back to you, Solo. All right, we have a question from one of our master's students, Robert Yao. Robert, if you'd like to unmute and ask your question. Uh, yeah, so I've seen that the machine learning success from recognizing samples from uh, the like sand collected in Texas. Uh, so do you think it will, you'll have like the same success maybe collecting samples from Bangladesh, from other countries to see if they can uh, the machine can recognize like where exactly the sand is produced yeah yeah so I'll, I'll start i'll start with the fact that i was surprised that it worked in texas um when i there so the, that project is funded by a, a, a blue sky innovation grant um from ut 
uh, in uh, the proposal that we originally submitted, we said that we were going to sample from California and Texas and New England, and we were going to sample from all these different places, um, because I was concerned that we wouldn't have enough leverage in the differences in the composition. And then we started to develop the case study in Texas with the samples, and oh, this is more leverage than we need. So I was surprised. Um, I was surprised how different even the rivers in Texas were. So then the broader question is, will this be globally applicable? And so I think that the case will be that, you know, can you distinguish sand from the James River in the east coast of the US from sand in the Irrawaddy? You know, maybe, but does it matter? Because you say, I'm in Southeast Asia, I'm only concerned about rivers in Southeast Asia. I'm not concerned about river, I'm not concerned about sand being shipped from North America. So the, the scale of the leverage is important. And this is not gonna work everywhere, right? This is, this is just a, a kind of initial pass, initial discrimination scheme um, that, that will hopefully at least give you some information. Um, but as long as rivers in the area that you're concerned with are distinguishable, and I think that there's good evidence that they will be from the sand that I have seen from South and Southeast Asia, um, it doesn't matter if every single river in the world is distinguishable from every single other river in the world. It only matters if it can answer the question that you're interested in asking in that place in the world. And I, I think that there's a strong likelihood that it will be useful in a lot of places. All right, well, we're coming up on our time. So maybe I'll just ask one last big yeah. picture question. Uh, really interesting talk. Let's park that on the side for a minute. So we're interested in sustainable earth system science. That's a really 